engaging the community since 1970. This is WIS Awareness. Good morning, and thanks for joining me on Awareness today. I'm your host, Leland Pender, coming to you with a little bit of a different setup this morning, so we'll see how this works out. But once again, thanks for being here. And today we're talking about... uh, PTSD, as June is PTSD Awareness Month, and how that relates and connects to racial trauma in the black community. Kind of a heavy topic here, but something that definitely exists and needs to be talked about. So to start this morning, I am joined by my guest, Dr. Markeisha Miller, a local uh, psychologist here in Columbia. How are you, Dr. Miller? I am good. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for being here and taking some time to discuss this with me. All right. So tell us first a little bit. So June is PTSD Awareness Month. Tell us about that. What is it and how does that apply to other things beyond what we might commonly first think of, which for me is the military? Exactly. So PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder, and you're absolutely correct, Leland. Most of the time when we think about it, we think about the military. We may even think about individuals who have been through assault or um, major critical incidents. And so it is post-traumatic stress disorder. I like to consider it as the inner wounds. It's the wounds that we don't see. And so it's very important because there's so many different aspects and symptoms that we see from individuals who may experience post-traumatic stress disorder because it really relates to any aspect of trauma. So we're talking about any individual who may have experienced some significant event that may have at some point triggered something in their life that can also have a correlation to post-traumatic stress disorder. And certainly issues of uh, racial uh, racism and violence, racial violence can qualify Uh, as what you just described. Absolutely. So this is a new thing. And so research is really moving along when we're talking about racial trauma and what that is. So the racial trauma aspect of it is stress-related trauma. And so based upon race. And we're talking about situations where um, it can really depend upon a historical context. So we're talking about we know that for years and years and years we have had um, a history that has been full of racial tension. And so when we're talking about racial trauma, we're talking about specifically dealing with people of color. However, we know that racial trauma has a tendency to affect the black community more. And with that, the black community has a history of we're talking about from slavery to oppression to even currently where individuals may still experience discrimination. We're seeing various things on the media where we're looking at police brutality. We're even seeing, even with COVID-19, where the black community is actually being hit with um, COVID-19 deaths more frequently or even being affected by COVID-19 even more. And so all of those things are triggered for the black community as it relates to racial trauma. So what does this uh, look like? What are the signs and symptoms? You know, how does this, I guess, manifest in everyday life here in 2020 for members of the black uh, population? So here's the thing. So um, over the last several weeks, I have seen a very um, vast increase in individuals who have been coming into my practice Um, both men and women. And we're talking about people who are having the inability to sleep. We know that sleep interruption is a part of PTSD, but it also comes up with racial trauma because we're talking about anxiety. We're talking about individuals who are having outbursts of crying. I had a woman to tell me the other day, she said, Dr. Miller, I was at my office and I just burst into tears. And I instantly started thinking about when I was a little girl, and I was the only black child in my class. And I started to remember what that felt like for me. And it triggered something in me. That's a piece of racial trauma. Because what happens is when we move into adulthood, we still start to have those triggers. We still start to have those moments where there may be some things that earlier in our um, past, throughout um, time previously, maybe we've been hurt by a racial encounter. Maybe we've been discriminated against. Maybe we have... Um, had racial slurs that were thrown at us, and it really hurt, and we never processed that. And so anytime we encounter something now in 2020, 
um, it is a reminder of that. It triggers that wound. It takes you back to uh, that feeling. And also, Leland, I would say it also moves into the understanding of generational trauma. Right. Uh, generation to generation, parents to kids, grandparents to parents to kids. Yes. It is. Yes. Because let me tell you. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, um, a young lady said to me, she said, Dr. Miller, I'm not having this conversation anymore. Because now, let me tell you, the talk is being modernized within the black community. And when we talk about the talk, we're not talking about the birds and the bees. We're mm -hmm. talking about black parents feeling as if they have to educate their children on how to survive being black, um, what the things to do, right? Yeah. And so for a lot of people, that's generational trauma. There are some safety tips. And when I talk about safety, I'm talking about mentally and emotionally learning um, when enough is enough for you. You know, there are times when we have to unplug. Um, there are times when we have to choose our battles. A lot of times when we're following social media, social media can be very emotionally draining. And so because of that, and we're seeing videos and we may see people who are saying hurtful things and we feel that for whatever reason, they may not understand the journey or they may not understand the hurt that we feel. It may be time to block. It may be time to unfollow those things. And so the first and the first and foremost is to take care of your own mental and emotional health. Start now. You know, start to heal and, and deal with those wounds. And I'll tell you, Leland, what really is making a big impact is people using their voice. That is really where we start to talk about healing the trauma, using their voice, speaking out. The thing about when you look at PTSD and racial trauma, PTSD becomes an infection of trauma, right? It, it, it goes to a point to where it was trauma that was not properly dealt with. And so when we're talking about racial trauma, if we're talking about how to cope, how to move past it, using that voice and putting meaning to it, that's a very, very powerful way, and it's a great start. I've been thinking a lot about my grandparents lately. They were the kinds of folks that if they were on their last dollar, they'd give you 50 cents and a tenfold plate of extra food to take home. We could use a lot more of that these days. Look out for your neighbor, work hard, and keep your promises, especially in Washington. Up there, people just lose their way. If elected, every day I serve South Carolina in the Senate, the spirit of my grandparents will be serving right along with me. I'm Jamie Harrison, and I approve this message. See the weather coming your way with WIS Skyview. Live weather cameras across the Midlands. On air, WISTV.com, and on your phone. WIS Skyview, sponsored by Great Southern Homes. Live green, live smart. Endurance wants to get you back on the road again, America. Protecting our employees and customers is our top priority, especially in these trying times. Even if you're driving less right now and your car is sitting idle, having the right vehicle protection is just as important as ever. Plus, cars are more prone to mechanical issues when they sit unused for long periods of time. Rest assured, we're here for you every step of the way. To learn more about our limited-time relief program, including $300 off any protection plan, call 855-821-0924. Don't gamble on just any law firm. Bet on a law firm with a proven track record. Doll all twos now. We got a $2.5 million jury verdict for our client when the other driver failed to yield. Don't scream, call Akeem. Dial all twos now. Welcome back this morning with Dr. Markeisha Miller talking about PTSD as June is PTSD Awareness Month and how that uh, connects to and relates to racial trauma often in minority communities, particularly the black community. Uh, I want to ask you, so we talked about how it obviously affects generations differently, but the whole family is still affected. Um, the, way that, the way that you treat as a psychologist someone who is my age or younger or you know okay. your parents or grandparents age is different what is the approach in getting that rectified for both groups 
So I think when you're talking about the younger generation versus the older generation, you've got to look at, um, you know, when we're talking about COVID-19, for example, and we're looking at who has a greater effect from it. And I think some of the things that we've seen with statistics is that the older you are, the greater you may be affected. The same thing can apply here. The older you are, the more wounds you may have, Mm -hmm. okay? Um, The greater impact you may have from racial trauma because you've lived with it longer. And so those, it may be a little harder for you to actually, number one, take a proactive stand, right? Um, Because sometimes when you've been oppressed for so long, it, it can become normalized. And I think what we're seeing now is the younger generation, A, they're doing more with mental health. They're actually reaching out. They're actually talking about what it feels like to be a black woman in today's society, what it feels like to be a black man in today's society. Um, they're actually using their voice and they're, they're protesting. They're looking at the changes that can be done versus I think what I'm seeing with my patients with the older generation is that because there has been so much damage mentally and emotionally, it may be a little harder to actually unpack that. Are there some things that parents and grandparents can do to maybe, you know, consciously not pass on some of that stuff to the younger generations or just be by nature of being in close proximity and being in households together and sharing stories is going to happen anyway? And is that also a good thing for those younger generations? You know, I often share the story when I was younger, I my parents loved to watch um, slave movies. I never understood what, what that was about, but they did. And as I got older, and I often share this story with my students, I didn't quite put the connection to slavery, being a black woman, and living in the United States, probably until I was in my late 20s, right? And so I think that when um, parents are having these conversations, it's important to have conversations with meaning, conversations that have purpose. Okay, so we're not just talking about things of the past or how history was, or we're not just talking, having these racial conversations without having a teachable moment, without actually having purpose. Because what happens when you don't do that is you leave your child to have to make meaning of that on their own. And I think that for many children, we often talk about um, that racial ideals are not Um, they're learned. It's a learned sense. And so that's why it's so important to make sure that when parents are having conversations around race, around those difficult things, around how history was 50 and 60 years ago, to make sure that you are providing an understanding for your child and not just leaving your child just to sit with that. Because if not, It does. You can instill fear in your child. That is where we're talking about the talk, right? Um, We don't want fear to be instilled in um, young black women, young black men. And so those are the things that we have to be cautious about as we're having these discussions so that we're not passing that trauma from generation to generation. And talking more about coping and, you know, dealing with it uh, in a healthy kind of way. Um, talk more about that, what some methods or mechanisms might be. And also, if you you know, have friends who have a different background than you, maybe you're in a relationship with someone of a different background with you, um, trying to Absolutely. help them understand that. Yes. And also, you know, um, doing some reading. You know, education is a, is a powerful thing. I'm a big believer in cinema therapy. I know that there are various um, outlets, Amazon and I think Netflix. They were showing movies that were very powerful, were very much talked about the empowerment of the black race. And they really identified a lot of things with systemic racism. That was very powerful because what happened is those movies started discussions. And that's good, right? Because this is how we learn to unpack trauma. This is how we learn to talk about things that people may be internalizing, to talk about things that maybe people maybe haven't got to a comfortable place to actually express. And so watching those movies, having those discussions, doing some reading, um, journaling, how are these things making you feel? How are you coping currently with everything that you're seeing? And also, and I always express this, and I cannot say it enough, mental health professionals are there for you. 
And as I talked about, the thing that we're seeing that's a wonderful piece now is that we know that in this generation, individuals are taking better care of their mental health so that they can move past the trauma and not pass it from generation to generation. It's MTV's 4th of July Super Stack Sales Event. Buy two, get two with value installation package. Stack on $75 off installation and rebates up to $100 off only at MTV. Hello, I'm William Shatner. And you may not know this about me, but years ago, I was diagnosed with a sleep disorder. And like millions of others, I was prescribed sleep equipment. Did you know sleep equipment manufacturers recommend daily cleaning? That's why I use So Clean. It's the perfect complement to my daily routine, and it's hassle-free. So Clean is fast and easy. It keeps my sleep equipment fresh every day without the need for disassembly. With So Clean, daily maintenance is a snap. All you do is place your equipment in, close the lid, and walk away. You can try So Clean risk-free for 30 nights. Order now and get a $70 instant rebate. So Clean is so fast and gives you peace of mind that your sleep equipment is fresh each time you use it. Call 1-800-489-5764. And for a limited time, get a $70 instant rebate. Call 1-800-489-5764. Or go to SoClean.com. Does learning a language feel like this? No habla espanol. Hablo. It's hablo? Yes. It's hablo. <laughs> when you learn a language, you want to actually use it. Babbel is designed with that goal in mind. Since my husband is from Guatemala, I'll apply what I've learned in the Babbel app to our real-life situations. The app is so easy to use, and it's so practical. It helps you learn things that you will actually need. Hoy es miércoles. Y el clima está muy bueno afuera. Language for life. Go to Babbel.com and try for free. Welcome back this morning. Uh, Leland Pender here talking about PTSD and racial trauma in the black community and how it affects generations of people. Right now I am joined by Dr. Napoleon Wells. I want to bring him in here. He is a clinical psychologist and also a professor of psychology at Claflin University in Orangeburg here in the Midlands. Thank you for joining me, Dr. Wells. Good morning. How you doing, Leland? Doing very well. Glad you are here. And I want to get your, your thoughts on this um, I was reading up on you and doing some research here, and you made a note in a talk you gave about how, first of all, racism and prejudice are two different things. I think a lot of people probably know that, but it doesn't really come out um, in practice and conversation. So kind of detail that for us first this morning. Sure. So a part of the conversation I've had consistently is kind of saying we're all capable of experiencing prejudice, and we all do. Uh, so we are all impacted by, for the most part, positively looking at qualities and things about ourselves and our, our community and understanding those things, right? So we are positively prejudiced towards things that are native to us, usually negatively prejudiced towards things that we see as being alien in some way. It is slightly different in that it is a racial prejudice, but also it goes outside of just the thought of prejudice. Racism is practice. It is racism in action. I'm sorry, it's racial prejudice in action. What you find, in fact, is that you take this fantasy that you have, that prejudice feed, and if you were to then say, you know what, I don't want those kind of people living near me. Racism is having the ability to make it so that your community looks a certain way. Make it so that your workspace looks a certain way. Make it so that your houses of worship, so that your police force, so that your professorship, so that your physician class, so that any space that you can find yourself in looks a certain way. It requires a kind of power and influence that goes beyond just kind of the psychic activity involved in prejudice. And a lot of that is something, of course, was experienced in the past and continues to be experienced today. So for the people who are the, the victims of that kind of behavior, how does that affect a person psychologically? 
And, you know, for those people who, of course, you know, grandparents who have kids, who have kids, you know, generations of people, how does that play into the, the family unit when you talk about African-American families? Yeah, critically important question, and thank you for it. I think a, a large part of what we miss is kind of the overall health crisis that we see with racial trauma and how it impacts the black community and has. So what you see with trauma that we see with post-traumatic stress disorder are people literally obsessing over what is about to happen, not just what has happened, but this belief that it's going to happen again and that it can happen repeatedly. And then there's the trauma that occurs to witnesses. PTSD can happen from direct impact of trauma, so it happened to me, or witnessing it. So what we find in these days and times is that there's so much news about what happens to black bodies. People are seeing these things. We saw what happened to a person. We were given so much information. What it causes in people is this kind of irritability, this kind of what we call hypervigilance. I am concerned about what is going to happen next to me because I am black. I am concerned about what is going to happen to those who I love because I am black, African-American. The kinds of things we're seeing where that irritability with that hypervigilance that relates directly to PTSD or loss of sleep, elevated physical symptoms that come along with PTSD, like elevated blood pressure, the anxiety that comes along with it. So in shared spaces, if I'm going to go out to a beach and I know I'm going to be in shared racial company, am I going to be a victim? As a black male, if I get into my car and I'm driving downtown, am I going to be a victim? And then what my family is worried about, what my kin are worried about, what all of those in my neighborhood who may be like me are worried about is what may happen to myself and to them. So we start to prepare for trauma. We start to teach our sons and our brothers and our fathers what they need to do when they get into a car and drive. We start to prepare ourselves for what's going to happen next. Even now, where we haven't had as many issues, in the last couple of weeks, we still are getting word and news of people who have been killed, bodies that have been harmed, and we're just preparing for that next one. We are preparing for the next incident that's going to occur, and we're not expecting very much relief. So how do you uh, how do you deal with that? I mean, you got to still live your life. You have to go to work. If you have kids or a family, you got to make sure they're okay and provide for them. Like life doesn't stop because you have to live with this anxiety or PTSD and trauma. So how do people do that, particularly African Americans? Mm-hmm. I think our community has consistently gone about coping with it, not always well, but have developed some means for it. Um, myself and a couple of other psychologists are working with, with what is known as the Black Joy Initiative. And it isn't something that we've come up with. We just looked at what our community had done for generations. In the midst of all of the things that have happened, practice a certain amount of personal happiness. Have agency around your sense of peace. But I think also going about the business of acknowledging what has happened, even setting boundaries. A lot of our community, I'm sure it's happened to you in some spaces as well, get pulled into having to explain how black people feel, explain what this trauma is like, explain what it is we want in this particular fight in any circumstances. And I think largely what I ask for people to do is to set boundaries. Be sure that you set boundaries. Keep your schedule, right? Make it so that the things that you do that bring you happiness, bring you contentment, bring you a sense of balance, you continue to do. Beyond that, I think making it so that in as many instances as possible, you are spending time with family and doing the things that relieve stress. Making sure that we are exercising as much as we can because we have agency in that space. Mm -hmm. Communicating with people who affirm you and spending time with affirmations every day to strengthen ourselves in some way. I think having sound emotional practices, not ignoring what is happening, acknowledging it, but then also claiming some space for ourselves. Even if that involves you saying, I'm not going to tune into what's happening today. I'm not going to be the example or the information source today. I'm just going to take care of myself. And talking about um, 
those who ascribe to you know racist or prejudiced uh, beliefs or perpetuate that against other people. And also reading up on you, you describe that mindset as literally an illness. Um, and usually illnesses can be treated. So for those people, if they're sick in that way, if it's a, an actual mental health condition, what is the treatment? H how can they be rehabilitated? So in describing it as an illness, and it isn't perfectly one, I think what we're looking at is how it develops. Very often it is based on what has been fed to the mind. Like what have I been taught about racially different people? What am I feeding myself continuously? Am I actively going about finding things that place those racial others in a negative light? And then it's a matter of saying, well, what do I feed myself different? How do I actively go about feeding myself healthy information and data about racial others? How do I actively go about the business of finding relationships and contexts and instances that will feed me positively? If I want to heal a sick mind around racial difference, how do I find people that I can be healthy with? And I can't be healthy with people who are preaching hate. I can't be healthy with someone who is telling me that human beings, as complex as we are, are black and white. I have to go about the business of crafting a healthy headspace that I then feed my mind in. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Wells. You are, we never lost your audio. Had a couple of moments of freezing there, but we were listening and got everything you said. Thank you so much. And we will take a quick break. Back here in just a few minutes on awareness. Hi, Joe Namath here. And like you, I'm at home staying safe. But I wanted to get this message out. To make these uncertain times a bit easier and safer while at home, Medicare Advantage plans have added new benefits, including telephone appointments with your doctors, in-home aids, home-delivered meals, home-delivered prescriptions, and so much more. But you don't get all the benefits automatically. You need to enroll. The easiest way to enroll is to call the Medicare Coverage Helpline. It's now more important than ever to make sure your Medicare coverage is up to date. We all have a few minutes to make a phone call to focus on our health. Get what you're entitled to. Call now. It's free. Call 1-800-973-1161. That's 1-800-973-1161 now. This is the kind of card that has America talking. With it, people with Medicare are getting all-in-one coverage for their doctor visits, hospital care, prescription drugs, and more. This kind of insurance, called Medicare Part C, may also cover dental care, eyeglasses, hearing aids, fitness programs, vitamins, even healthy meals and rides to the doctor. With this kind of coverage, you do not need a Medicare supplement insurance plan. You will access your benefits through your Medicare Part C plan for one low and oftentimes zero dollar monthly plan premium. You deserve to get the most from your Medicare benefits. Call now for free information that may help you get more coverage for less money. There is no obligation to enroll. Whether for yourself or someone you love, call the number on the screen now. Call now. Well, thanks for joining us today on Awareness. I'm your host, Leland Pinder, and thank you to Drs. Uh, Markeisha Miller and Napoleon Wells for their input and their thoughts today as well. We'll see you next time.